This is Ling 270, Language, Technology, and Society, an undergraduate course offered by the Department of Linguistics at the University of Illinois. This course is divided into multiple modules. In this module, we are examining the question, how does writing as a technology represent language? In this recording, we are examining the Japanese writing system and looking at how the Japanese writing system encodes the Japanese language. Let's take a moment and identify the learning objective for this recording. This recording corresponds to content in section 3.2 and 3.1 in chapter 3 of the textbook Language, Technology, and Society by Richard Sprout. After reading that material and watching this video, you should be able to identify the major components of the Japanese writing system. You should be able to describe how, for each of these major components, linguistic information is encoded using that component of the Japanese writing system. Japanese is a mixed writing system. The Japanese writing system is not made up of a single component, such as we saw in Chinese with Chinese characters, nor as we see in, for example, English with a single alphabet. Rather, the Japanese writing system is a mixed system, combining kanji and two kana syllabaries. It has been argued that the Japanese writing system is one of the most complex writing systems that has ever been developed in the history of writing. Indeed, it is quite possible that the Japanese writing system is the single most complex writing system in history. Let's look at kanji. Kanji is one major component of the Japanese writing system. Kanji consists of characters borrowed from Chinese. These Chinese characters borrowed into the Japanese writing system are used in Japanese to represent content words. There are two major ways that kanji represents content words. First, kanji can be used to directly represent Chinese loanwords. So, in this use case, a symbol in kanji borrowed from Chinese is used to represent the same concept that would be represented by that same symbol in Chinese. Moreover, the Chinese pronunciation is borrowed into Chinese, into Japanese. In this way, these kanji symbols used to represent Chinese loanwords are acting in the same way that the Chinese writing system acts, that is, as a logo syllabary. A pure logography represents a morphine in each symbol. A pure syllabary represents a syllable per symbol. Chinese is a logosyllabary in that each symbol represents a morphine, but also happens to represent a Chinese syllable. In this way, Many Chinese symbols carry sound information. Kanji are also used 
to represent native Japanese words, that is, words that existed in the Japanese language that were not borrowed from Chinese. When kanji is used in this way, kanji acts as a logography. Each kanji symbol, when used to represent a native Japanese word, represents a Japanese morpheme. No sound information is encoded in how these Japanese words should be pronounced. We'll see an example of this later on. Interestingly, these kanji symbols can be used in these two ways, representing a Chinese loanword and also a native Japanese word that is synonymous with that Chinese loanword. We'll see an example of this. A subset of kanji symbols are native Japanese symbols. That is, symbols that were created in Japan to represent new content words. The kokuji symbols are also a logography. There are relatively few kokuji symbols. These symbols represent native Japanese words formed primarily through semantic compounding. The second major component of the Japanese writing system are the kana syllabaries. Japanese has two syllabaries that are both actively used in Japanese writing today. The first is the hiragana syllabary. The second is the katakana syllabary. Each of these two syllabaries has a distinct use. They are used in separate circumstances. Let's examine when you would use a hiragana symbol and when you would use a katakana symbol. Symbols from the hiragana syllabary are used to represent Japanese grammatical endings, non-content words, and also sometimes used as a reading aid. Symbols from the katakana syllabary are used in a different situation, specifically to represent foreign words and foreign names. Let's now look at a couple of examples of kanji. Kanji, as we said, is primarily a logography. When kanji symbols are used to represent Chinese loanwords, kanji is acting in a very similar way to the Chinese writing system, that is, as a logosyllabary. When representing a Chinese loanword, each kanji symbol represents a morpheme borrowed from Chinese. Now, in Chinese, it happens to be that each morpheme corresponds to exactly one syllable, and thus each Chinese symbol corresponds to a morpheme and also a syllable. Thus, when a kanji symbol is used to represent a Chinese loanword, that, that kanji symbol represents a borrowed morpheme that also happens to be exactly one syllable long. For native Japanese content words, kanji acts as a pure logography. A pure logography is a writing system where each symbol represents a morpheme and does not also carry sound information in it. Now, Japanese, unlike Chinese, 
allows for multisyllabic morphemes. So, each kanji symbol, when used to represent a Japanese native content word, represents exactly one Japanese morpheme, but that morpheme may be multisyllabic. We'll see an example of this later on. A subset of kanji are the kokuchi, or so-called national characters. These kokuchi are formed primarily through semantic compounding, and as such can be thought of as acting somewhat like an ideography. An ideography is a writing system where each symbol directly represents an idea rather than a morpheme, a syllable, or a sound. Even kokuji are truly logographic, but can be thought of as having a little bit of an ideographic aspect in that these kokuji symbols were formed through semantic compounding. Let's look at particular examples. We've established that in the kanji writing system, the same character borrowed from Chinese can have different readings depending on the context. In some contexts, this reading will be a Sino-Japanese reading, that is, a meaning borrowed from Chinese with a borrowed Chinese pronunciation. The very same character, though, may represent a synonymous native Japanese word. Let's look at an example of a kanji symbol that is borrowed from Chinese and has a pronunciation that's also borrowed from Chinese. So here is ri, meaning carp. Ri is a Japanese word formed as a Chinese loan word. This character, as we can see, is made up of two component characters. Now, in Chinese, these two components would tell a reader roughly what the symbol means and how it's pronounced, thus logosyllabaric. So, the first component that we see here in red means fish. So, a carp is a kind of fish. So this red symbol is telling us information about the semantics of the symbol. The second component in blue tells the Chinese reader information about the pronunciation, li. Apologies for my poor Chinese and Japanese pronunciations. Now, when this word is borrowed into Japanese, li becomes ri. And thus, we have a kanji symbol that originated in the Chinese writing system representing a Chinese loanword meaning carp. Now, it happens that there already was a native Japanese word for carp. And that word was koi. So koi uses the exact same symbol. So we had ri, meaning carp, and koi, also meaning carp. The first ri was a Chinese loan word. The second uses the Chinese symbol, but represents the Japanese native morpheme, koi. Both of these words, then, have the same meaning, carp, but represent two morphemes, koi, the native Japanese morpheme for carp, and ri, a borrowed Chinese morpheme, also meaning carp.
Let's now look at a sentence. This is a sentence in, in Japanese. So, in this sentence, we have a particular character that's used twice. This character occurs first in blue, so the third character from the beginning, and again later in red. This symbol means mountain in both cases. The first case we see is in blue. So let's try to read the sentence. And again, apologies for my poor Japanese pronunciation. Fujisan wa takai yamadasu. Meaning, Mount Fuji is a high mountain. Now, at the beginning, we have san. So the symbol in blue is pronounced san. This is the Chinese loan word for mountain. Later, we have the same symbol, also meaning mountain, but using the native Japanese word, yama. Now, remember what we talked about earlier that Chinese morphemes are always monosyllabic. So here, san is a single syllable. Yama, on the other hand, has two syllables in it. So it's easy to see that yama must be the native Japanese pronunciation because it has two syllables. Let's move on. Next, we have the kana syllabaries. There are two kana systems, hiragana and katakana. Each of these two kana systems is a syllabary. Each kana symbol represents exactly one Japanese syllable. Now, there are about 150 legal syllables in the Japanese language. But each of these two syllabaries, hiragana and katakana, are incomplete. What does that mean? Well, a complete syllabary would be one that has exactly one symbol for each syllable in the language. English, for example, has thousands of legal syllables. So a complete English syllabary, if one were to be attempted, would need one, one symbol for each of those syllables. If we had a complete Japanese syllabary, there would be about 150 symbols. But there are fewer symbols than that in hiragana and similarly in katakana. That means that there are some Japanese symbols that do not have a corresponding kana symbol, but those symbols, those syllables can still be represented using the kana syllabaries. So let's consider very briefly the history of kana. So each of the two kana systems developed separately from kanji. So, we had Chinese symbols that were borrowed into Japanese and then, for a time, used for their pronunciation. The symbols evolved, as we see here over time, into the hiragana syllabary and separately into the katakana syllabary. This chart shows hiragana syllables. So on the left, we have an onset. And on the top, we have a vowel. So the top row represents standalone vowels. The second row represents syllables that begin with k and then have one of the five vowels. 
The next row is syllables that start with s or sh, and so on. Here is an example of a Japanese word, meaning this, represented in the hiragana syllabary. The first syllable, seen here in blue, is ko. The second symbol, also now in blue, is no, so ko no. Let's now examine the katakana syllabary. Here we see a chart laid out very similarly from the hiragana chart. The katakana chart shown here and the hiragana chart shown previously are both taken from Wikipedia. Again, in the top row, we have syllables representing simple vowels. In the second row, we have syllables that begin with k and then have a vowel, and so on. Let's look at a word written in katakana. This is a foreign name, namely the state of Illinois. We have four katakana symbols used here. The first, e, re, no, i. Both of these systems, as I mentioned before, are incomplete syllabaries. Here we see an example of a legal Japanese syllable, namely ryu, that does not have a single symbol for it. So ryu is a single syllable in Japanese, but in order to represent this in writing, one must use two kana symbols, ri followed by yu. So, we have now explored how the Japanese writing system encodes language. Let's summarize. Japanese is a mixed writing system. The Japanese writing system may be the most complex ever developed. It includes kanji, which were borrowed Chinese characters, each representing a content word in Japanese. Kanji can be used to represent Chinese loanwords with Chinese borrowed pronunciations into Japanese. When used in this way, kanji can be thought of in the same way that the Chinese writing system can be thought of, namely a logosyllabary. Kanji also are used to represent native Japanese words, which are synonymous with the corresponding Chinese loanwords. Kanji, when used in this way, represent a logography, that is, each kanji symbol representing a native Japanese word represents exactly one Japanese morpheme and does not contain sound information. A subset of kanji are the so-called national characters or kokuji characters, also representing content words, but those content words were formed through semantic compounding. So the kokuji characters are a logography that can be thought of as having a minor ideographic component in that they are formed through semantic compounding. But even the kokuji characters are not ideographs, but rather logographs. In addition to the kanji system, the Japanese writing system uses two distinct syllabaries, hiragana and katakana. Hiragana is used 
for grammatical endings, non-content words, and as a reading aid. And each hiragana symbol represents a syllable, so represents only sound information. Each katakana symbol is used when writing foreign words or foreign names in Japanese. Each katakana symbol also represents exactly one Japanese syllable and thus is representing purely sound information. This concludes our examination of the Japanese writing system and how Japanese encodes language in its writing system.